Welcome to another ETA Newsroom interview. This time we are staying with the Eclectia Alban participants. In this case, it is Merrill Bankhauser of Surf Rock fame. And you may not have heard of him. Indeed, I have to admit, I had not heard of him a few years back when I interviewed him on my Amash Files radio show. And what he had to tell me was absolutely fascinating. One of the reasons I'm interviewing Merrill, who's all the way out in California, and unfortunately we don't have any internet connection, but we do have the phone and we'll be listening to some of his albums. And the most exciting thing is that he is featured on the Eclectia album and his song is Calling from a Star. Merrill knows all about the UFO side of things. He knows that they're a reality, saw one himself. He has been around the world of music and rock for quite a few years, since the 60s. And his probably most famous song that you will maybe not know the name of, but you will certainly know the sound of, is called Wipeout. <laughs> big hit all the way back in 1962. Well, he has never stopped working, has never stopped producing with over 400 and odd songs to his credit, loads of albums and a lot of TV and movies using his songs and tracks. I'm really dying for you to hear what Merrill has to say, not only about being part of this incredible album Eclectia, which features the X Factor element with musicians and singer-songwriters. Everybody has had either a sighting or a close-up and personal interaction with these other intelligences. And Merrill is no different. We'll find out that some of his albums have some of the paranormal to it. So hold on to your hats. You're in for a fascinating ride. Friday, 23rd of March, 2023. I am here with Merrill Fankhauser, father of Surf Rock. Do you tell us about this getaway cabin that you had and then the stories that you heard about what was happening there? I was referring to the uh, cover of the Message to the Universe album that I did when I was living on Maui. And it has me up on this hill with the crater in back of me and a little alien band around the bottom playing with me. And this all came about my cabin that I would get away into the rainforest. And I love to go out there and get inspired and write music. Well, a guy that lived way out in the jungle there, he was saying that he would wake up in the middle of the night and hear these noises in his banana patch and he'd go out and he swore there were little aliens there in the banana patch doing something with his bananas. And uh, I thought it was such a funny and interesting story that it inspired me to write the song Alien Talk. And uh, it's on the Message to the Universe album that for years was only out on a vinyl LP, and now it's out on a CD.
And when the album came out, the song Alien Talk was the song that really took off on that album. A lot of people still will not know your background and, uh, and people will know that you're in California from the intro, but they don't know how you got started with your interest in UFOs and also the music because that is such a factor and feature in, of course, the album that brings those pieces together of Eclectia, which is the album with those participants who have the X factor of either seeing or having interaction with other intelligences. Yeah, well, my dad uh, was a flight instructor and I lived on a few airports where he had flight schools and taught people to fly. And he taught me to fly when I was about 14 years old. And I was always interested in aviation, but also UFOs. And I remember asking my dad if he really thought there was somebody out there. And he said, yes. He said, it would be too egotistical of us to think we're the only ones in the universe. And that always stuck with me, Joanna. And uh, for years, as I was growing up, I was always looking for UFOs. And I never saw one. And then in 1974, I was living on the island of Maui with my band Moo. We had moved over there because I was studying the lost continent of Mu at that time, and it was believed the islands were part of that continent. So we went up to the top of Haleakala Crater to watch the sunset one night. And there's a beautiful spot there by an observatory that you can drive up to in a parking lot and hike up this hole, and you can see into the crater and it, the sunsets up there are just spectacular. So the sun went down and there was a lot of tourists up there and it was getting dark and we decided to stay a little longer and so did a few other people and all of a sudden this blue light came over the top of the crater and it started pulsating. And everybody went, ooh, what is that? It's not a helicopter. You couldn't hear any sound. And then two little lights came out of it, and they formed a tetrahedron, an inverted pyramid. And there was an older gentleman uh, standing next to me that had been in the military in World War II, and he said, I saw a lot of things, but I've never seen anything like this. And we watched it for four or five minutes, and then all the lights, the two little lights, went back into the big light, and it shot straight up in an instant and disappeared. Well, we went down to our house in Haiku, and uh, I always kept a fresh reel of tape on the old two-track tape recorder, picked up the guitar, and the song Calling from a Star just came out of me. And that's the way that song was composed, which is on the Eclectia album. And then uh, when we went back to Los Angeles, I recorded it in a recording studio and uh, it became quite a, a radio hit all over the world and people still request it today and uh, it's one of my favorite songs and then we went back up in about 1978 and did the video for Calling from a Star at the top of the crater.
and the video got a lot of play on television stations all over the world in UK, Germany, uh, oddly enough in South America and uh, in Australia. And I'd love you to just tell the story to what John Lennon's comments were. Yeah, I was still living on Maui and it was early 70s, but I was friends with the singer-songwriter Harry Nelson in the 60s. We both wrote for a publishing company and we were in little cubby offices in Hollywood. He and I became good friends and he was putting albums out on RCA and the Beatles heard him and really liked his work. And when John Lennon came over to L.A., he looked Harry up. They had called Harry on the phone. And uh, first, it was Paul McCartney that called and said, Harry, this is Paul McCartney. We really love your material. And he goes, who is this? And he hung up on McCartney. And then John called, and John says, Harry, this is John Lennon. It really is. Please don't hang up. And that's how their friendship started. John came over, and he and Harry had a famous night out on the Sunset Strip that's written in different books and things. They did a bit of drinking. and But anyhow, Harry calls me up on Maui and says, Merle, I'm having a party at my house in the Hollywood Hills, and I know you're coming over here to record. I'd really like to have you come to the party. So they sent a limo for me. I was staying at a producer's house in, in L.A., and uh, I had my acoustic guitar with me, and I walked in, and there was about 30 people there, and he said, this is my friend Merle from Maui, and he's going to play a few songs for us. And I looked across the room, and I went, oh, my God, that's John Lennon sitting there. <laughs> and I played in front of thousands of people, Joanna, and I never in my life got nervous. But I got a little nervous when I saw John sitting there. I I think uh, his and Yoko's housekeeper, May Pang, was there sitting to John, played my song, On Her Way to Hana, that talks about being a UFO while driving through this beautiful road with cascading waterfalls in the jungle on Maui. And as soon as I finished the song, John started talking to me and said, that was very interesting what inspired that song. And so I told him, and then I played a few more songs, and I went over near where the food buffet was set up, and John motioned me into this alcove and started talking to me, and we were talking about songwriting. Isn't it interesting where a song comes from or how it's inspired? And if somebody talks to you while you're getting this inspiration or another piece of music comes on, it can erase this song that's coming to you. He said, I never wrote any of those songs in the Beatles, and I looked kind of astonished. And he said, my muse gave them to me. And he said, you never know when it's going to happen. And I said, yeah, my best songs are written exactly like that. It just comes to me, and my best songs are written in 15 minutes. I don't sit down and say I'm going to write a song about something. I hear it all finished in my head, and then got to go, after I write the lyrics down and the melody, I got to go figure out what the music, the chords are. And he called it automatic writing, and that stuck with me forever, Joanna. And now, you know, bless his heart, he's gone. And I cried when I heard, you know, what happened to him. And actually, I've had the pleasure of talking to Yoko on the phone a couple of times. And she said, yeah, when he came back from L.A., he mentioned you, how inspired and talented you were as a songwriter. And I've talked to her once since, and I've heard that she's now in a wheelchair. It probably wouldn't have been then too much later after your meeting John then that he actually had his own 
up close and personal sighting in New York because that was only in 1974. Over yeah. here, up there, I saw a UFO and it went down the river, turned right at the United Nations, <laughs> turned left and then down the river. It wasn't a helicopter, it wasn't a balloon and it was so near, silent and it looked dark like black or grey in the middle and had white lights, just looked like light bulbs, you know, just going off, on, off, on, off, on, blink, 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 blink. The I understand the that he was actually visited and given yeah. a metallic object that is an egg like I don't know what that is. Yuri Geller has it in his museum out in, in Israel now. Uh, apparently John was really scared about that and that's why he gave this little artifact to Yuri Geller as far as I understand. Yeah, I mean the way it just comes through me and I can't even explain it. To people and now I have nearly 50 albums out you know counting other groups and solo and this discography that a discographer did on me he found 138 releases counting the compilations like Eclectia and other ones that I'm on and that's not counting the bootlegs there's a lot of bootlegs out there and I look at my wall of stuff Joanna I, in my studio, I can't even fit all my releases on the walls in there. I don't have enough room, and I go, my gosh, how did I do all of this? I remember one time the fantastic uh, movie and record producer, William E. McEwen, that produced my Return to Moo album. He produced the Nitty Gritty Dirt Band and the Allman Brothers. He said, Merle, do you know? you have at least 10 times more albums than the Rolling Stones and the Beatles put together. And I said, yeah, but the difference is, is that all of theirs are million sellers, and I've only had two million sellers. But he said, that's still quite a body of work. He said, I'm really impressed at how prolific you are. And Joanna, the local college here, it's a prestigious college in San Luis Obispo, not too far from me. They just interviewed me last week, and they're doing a digital presentation on me and all my work. It's going to be in the college and in a museum in Paso Robles to inspire college students that are majoring in music in the arts and i think that's wonderful my friends on maui though all say merle you've belonged in a museum for a long time but <laughs> these awards now they gave me a an award for the california central coast music artist that has come out of this area and they gave me a local music legend and that was only in november last year 2022 and that was on television here. And I'm, I'm very blessed uh, after all I've done, you know, the recognition is nice. Too. Yeah, absolutely. And it is the Local Legend Award. Uh, this one is someone who has contributed to our local music scene for many years. At tonight's Local Legend Award, we are recognizing Merle Finkhauser. Yeah. Merle is arguably the biggest name in rock and roll to ever emerge from the Central Coast. Uh, born in Louisville, Kentucky, he took up the guitar after moving to California as a teenager, eventually joining local instrumental surf rock band The Impacts in 1961. Delphi Records released their classic Wipeout album in 1962. In 1967, UIP Records released Fankhauser's psychedelic folk rock album, Fapper Dockley. It basically represents a, a piece of each band member's name that was in his band at the time, Fapper Dockley. And now a valuable collector's item. Uh, that album sells for something like $1,500 for a sealed copy. So uh, then came Things by Merle Fankhauser and HMS Bounty on UNI Records. Next came two albums by Merle's group, MU, on ERA and RTV Records. 1971 then, second album on United Artists Records in 1974. And then Merle's solo record, 
Maui album came out in 1976 on Maui Music Records. 1995, Merle joined forces with spirit drummer Ed Cassidy and formed the Fankhauser Cassidy Band. And D-Town Records released their On the Blue Road album. Many Merle solo albums followed. Just last month, on October 28th, Amazon released an anthology titled Going Round in My Mind, the Merle Fankhauser Anthology, 1964 to 1979. All told, he's written and released more than 400 songs over the last 60 years. I think you can see why we're going local legend with this guy. Since 2001, he's hosted Tiki Lounge, a music and interview program that airs on the Central Coast, Southern California, Hawaii, and parts of the East Coast. He is truly a living legend, an international treasure, who happens to call the Central Coast home. And we are so lucky to have him tonight on our stage. Ladies, gentlemen, days, thems, Merle Fankhauser. That was from 1976, from my Maui album. And I actually got to sing one of those songs from that album to John Lennon at Harry Nelson's house. And it was amazing when I met John and he loved my music, but I was so nervous. I'd never gotten nervous before in front of anybody and my lips started twitching. <laughs> We talked about songwriting, and he said, the best songs are written when they just come to you. He said, I didn't write any of those songs in the Beatles. My muse gave them to me. And I said, my best songs are written in 15 minutes. And he said, mine too. And he called it automatic writing. And that stuck with me forever. And now, I can't believe it, I'm standing up here, 60 years ago, our band, The Impacts, was a house band at the Rose Garden Ballroom in Pismo, and it's now, appropriately, a surf shop. And I, I can't believe that it was that long ago, and people ask me, well, when did you record Wipeout? I was 17, and, and Delphi Records discovered us there and put out our Wipeout album that eventually sold a million copies. It, it's st still out there on CD. I just can't thank Glenn Starkey enough for all the years that he's written reviews about all of my releases. Now I have over 45 albums out, one Grammy nomination. I'm gonna be in a movie with the Beatles and the Rolling Stones next year. And it's a tribute to the piano player, Nicky Hopkins, who played on John Lennon's Imagine. He played on the Rolling Stones records the Beatles, Rod Stewart, on my records, too. The movie is going to be called The Session Man, so look for that in theaters next year. Here I am, I'm an official geezer now, and I'm still, still going and still rocking. Thank you, New Times. And I'd love to ask you, Meryl, just harking back to childhood and family, whether your father as an aviator ever had any experience of seeing anything or indeed any of the people that he taught or your family? No, that was the interesting thing. And my dad was a charter pilot besides a flight instructor. So he would fly businessmen and different people down to Mexico, all across the United States. And he was amazed that he never saw anything that he couldn't explain. What was the impact your sighting had on you? Because, well, of course, there were others it there. It was a validation to me, Joanna, that they are real. 
and there is beings out there. And an interesting point, there was an older college professor on Maui. His name was Mr. Bonzi, a beautiful, delightful man. He believed that the UFOs were coming to the Haleakala Crater because there was some kind of an ore there. He called it KR-422, and he said, that's what they use to refuel their electromagnetic engines. He said that's why, because people had seen them in the crater often. And uh, th there was a story about when Jimi Hendrix and the film crew were filming Rainbow Bridge on Maui, and he wanted to hike in the crater, and they hiked in the crater, and they said there in broad daylight, because silver disc came and hovered in front of the whole crew and jimmy walked out and said welcome space brothers with his arms open they were trying to get a big movie camera because they didn't have these nice little you know video cameras then trying to get this big thing off of a mule and when they moved the camera over towards the ufo it just in a blink of an eye disappeared well, that's pretty so, amazing. And was that the exact same spot where you would have seen what you saw? No, because they were in the floor of the crater. Uh, we were up on the top rim of the crater, which would be maybe another 800 feet taller up there. But I have hiked through the floor of the crater before and spent the night in there and slept in a cave. The guys in Moo and a couple of lady friends went with us, and it was quite an adventure. We were looking all night that night, and we didn't see a thing. It's a very difficult hike, because when you're at 10,500 feet, you know, your windpipe wants to close up. It's not easy to breathe. It's actually, there's a picture on one of our albums of us in the crater and i'm glad i did all of those things when i was much younger <laughs> i've always been sort of a spiritual person even when i was a young kid i would meditate a lot and then when i moved to maui uh, there was a tibetan buddhist ashram there I got to meditate with the lamas, and I took initiation, and I played music for them. And mine was the first music from this part of the world they ever heard. And it was my spiritual messages, and I sang them a song about Mu, and I sang them a song about UFO. And then they gave me this certificate that I still have, the name on it that they gave me, was Lodru Chansau, which translates to Oceans of Intelligence. I wrote a song called Oceans of Intelligence. I was inspired to write that. The lyrics on that still, when I read them or listen to the song, it gives me chill. The Lamas, I, oh, I got along so well with them and I got to talk to them about the lost continent of Mu, and they believed in that, and UFOs for sure. They believed, you know, in other beings from other worlds. And that was a very inspirational time for me, and all of this contributes to the subject matter in my songs. And then the other album, uh, years later, I was over here, and we took a drive towards the Area 51, where they say they have a captured saucer. And, and I went out there with a group, and we videoed it and actually put part of it on my TV show, Tiki Lounge. You can't get in through the gates. You have to have a clearance. But there's a restaurant and bar and mobile home area in the middle of the desert out there. Yes, I've been there. You have the yeah. little alien hen. <laughs> yeah, little alien. <laughs> it's amazing. Yeah. And well, we did a whole thing there and videoed it. People everywhere, when they saw that, loved it. I tried to get some of the people in there to talk about things. They were open to me and let me 
video in there, but they didn't have much to say. That kind of inspired me to do the uh, CD album called Area 51 Suite. And that was uh, Rob Ailing, the head of Gonzo Multimedia Records in uh, London. He said, you must do uh, songs about Area 51. And that was another thing. I sat down, Joanna, and probably in two weeks I wrote all the songs that were on that album. I really just feel it's all a gift, thankful every day. Well, I was living still in Los Angeles at the time because we were recording and playing there a lot. And that's when I found the book in a house I had rented called The Lost Continent of Moo by Colonel James Churchward. His great-grandson has been communicating with me now through emails. But when I found this book, and it said that the islands of Hawaii were the mountain peaks of the lost continent of Mu, that at one time it was up out of the water, all of the islands, and that was Mu, and that's when the water... The ocean was in our deserts here in California. And there's places you can go and you can find fossilized starfish and things that you can tell have been under the water out in the desert here. So I told the guys, we've got to go to Moo. And we had changed the name of the band to Moo and we were studying everything we could find on it. And so we went to Maui, the record company, he said, what, you're moving to an island in the middle of the Pacific? And I said, yeah, it's our destiny, and it's something we have to do. And so uh, we had our first Moo album out already. Through the studies, I found that a lot of the South American Indians had Moo written in all of their hieroglyphics and everything. And Colonel Churchward mentions that in his book, shows the symbol. So we moved over there. We were scheduled to play a concert there, and as soon as we did that and we rented the house that we moved into, I was off in the jungle looking for things. And when I built the cabin in the jungle and I leased this land from an old Hawaiian family, and when the older man, Johnny Kahamoi, came down and saw how I had cleared the land in this valley and rebuilt these 200-year-old carol patch walls. He started crying. He said, this is amazing, Merle. He said, my daughter and my son, they work for United Airlines, and they both live in L.A. They won't stay here and work the land like you're doing. He said, I want to show you something in this valley over here. So he took me down by the stream, showed me these cut stairs. They looked like they'd been cut with a saw or something. They weren't anything Hawaiian. The Hawaiian just basically stacked up lava rocks. And these, you could tell somebody had manufactured these steps going down into this valley. And he wouldn't go down there. He said, I used to go down there and play as a little kid. He said, but my parents told me, don't you go down there, Johnny. The moo will get you and take you away. He was now a Christian, and there was a Hawaiian church there that I would sometimes go sing in. And he told me how the missionaries came and made everybody not talk about any Hawaiian history that they knew of or anything ancient. They changed them all to Christian. They were trying to convince them it was a devil's work to believe the old way. So anyhow, had a camera, uh, just a still camera, and I walked down these steps, and I was just marveled at how somebody cut these steps going down into this valley by the stream. And then I turned around and looked, and there were three pillars that were maybe 40 feet tall, and I swear they looked like Mayan or Incan or even a little touch of Greek, the way they were like carved, knurled sides. And it was a beautiful scene because there was a pristine waterfall going down. Two of them were standing in a pool, and one had broken off and was laying in the pool. So 
I took a picture of this one, and then I noticed there was like a flat sort of sidewalk under this growth called halbush, which is like giant hibiscus, and it was leading down to the ocean. I followed that all the way down, and I could see where it went out into the water, and then I could see where the lava flow, it flowed over it. And that lava in that area, that flow was over a thousand years old. So I knew those steps and that sidewalk, if you will, was over a thousand years old. And then later, German archaeologists came over and they carbon dated those pillars and those steps. And it came out that they were over 10,000 years old. And that's in my book, Calling yeah. from a Star, the Merle Fankhauser story, and the picture is in there. And then I found a pyramid in Haleakala Crater, and it was sticking out of the lava flow about 40 feet, and I risked my life hiking to it. You're not supposed to leave the trail, and I jumped these deep chasms that I could have fallen into to get to it climbed up on the side of it and got such vertigo I thought I was going to, you know, just fall over. I got to a vantage point where I could take a picture of that. Then on the other side of the island of Maui, the desolate side, there's a rock trail that goes out into these ancient ruins. And uh, the Hawaiians go out there and fish, but they're afraid to stay there at night leave before it gets dark. Well, there was a building out there that some surfers called Lost City Hall, and it was this Hawaiian Heiau building that was built, and you could tell it's Hawaiian lava boulders. The roof on it had long since deteriorated, but a guy told me, you go over in the right corner and there's a hole there and a rickety ladder that somebody made. Go down there and look at that. And I did, Joanna, and the rock and stonework, it was like a basement. It was the same as on the complete other side of the island. And the story went, and this is in a book written by a Hawaiian called Children of the Rainbow. When the Hawaiians came to Maui from Tahiti, there were several thousand people living in that area before the lava came and flowed over everything. They said that it was a Caucasian race and they were mostly blonde and red haired. And there was an axe head found in there, a stone axe head that wasn't like anything the Hawaiians would make. And that's in the Bishop Museum in Honolulu, and they believe it might be Viking origin. But an interesting thing, a journalist from National Geographic magazine heard about my expedition out there, and I videoed some of it. Back then, we were carrying the first video cameras, but they were huge. And um, I talked to the, the uh, local newspaper about it which in a way was a mistake because there was a lot of people that didn't want this exposed and they did a little article on it in the paper and they did an article about the pyramid I found and nobody had known about any of those things and even young Hawaiians would get in touch with me and go, my father, my grandfather, nobody ever told me about this, you know, and they were amazed that I knew all of this and discovered it because I was on a search to find the remnants of Mu and I found something. <laughs> and did anybody ever go and were they ever able to date the pyramid? No, that I don't know. I know that the Parks Department, they were actually upset with me that I left the trail and went to that. And uh, they said, we could find you, but we're not. But that's a warning. They didn't like the fact that it got in the newspaper, and they said because it's very dangerous to get there because there's even a chasm that is called the bottomless pit. If you fall in there, who knows where you go? You're down into a lava tube in the 
dormant volcano somewhere. I was able to do all of this and document it. And like I said, there's pictures of all of that in my book. Correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Mel, but was it Michael Luckman who wrote the book Alien Rock who told you uh, about this anomaly in the ocean in Malibu? Michael Luckman viewed me about my UFO stuff and then he was communicating with the old World War II radio expert that lived in the hills of Malibu and picked up those odd signals coming out of the ocean one night. And uh, because he knew all kinds of code and signals and everything, this was like something he never heard. Michael Luckman about it. And you said that hill above Point Doom or Doom, yeah. uh, Malibu. Yes. They had been seeing UFOs going in and out of the water since the 40s. And when that Signals from Malibu album came out, I was doing a lot of radio interviews, and this lady called up, and her and her daughter used to go down to the ocean in the late 50s at night. It was a regular thing, and watch, watch the lights going in and out of the water. And she knew all about that, and that several other people did too, and supposedly they had been seeing things in that area since the 1940s. And this gentleman who was speaking to Michael Luckman, his book is called Alien Rock, and uh, that when I read it, that's when I was thrilled to find out that even Elvis had sightings. It was fascinating, but was the gentleman from the war, was, was, did it get his attention because these sounds or signals were particularly unusual? Yes, uh, because he was recording the Japanese transmissions and code and stuff. That was his job in the Second World War. And this was like nothing he'd ever heard. And when they, he sent the signals to me, I turned them on and I ended up writing two songs that I put the signals in. And I sat down at the piano with the signals playing so I could hear it. And it was almost like they were playing me. And I didn't even know what chords I was playing on the piano or anything. And I recorded it. And then the band came over and they went, wow, you played that? And I, I said, yeah, listen to this. I put those signals there loud on that Messages from the Dome song. And that's the one that uh, I told you. And Several stations, when it got to that part, it took them off the air. What the thing was, the stations that I had had problems with, there was one in Austin, Texas, there was one in Sacramento, and I thought there was one in England. When they would get to that part of the song where I brought those signals out loud on the end, it would shut them off. But the stations that had older mixing boards and the ones that were analog didn't affect them it affected mainly the ones with newer digital mixing boards
there was actually three signals counting the lower register talking ones and the two high ones. That was interesting when he examined it and he examined it on audio equipment that gave him readouts. He said, yeah, he never heard anything like that either. I recorded the signals into my digital multi-track and, my, and had no problem with it. And I even did, just for an experiment, I made an analog tape of it, and I could do that. I don't know what it is. It's when it's broadcast out there, the older equipment doesn't have a problem with it. Did you find that some people had a an emotional response to the sounds? Yeah, there was one lady that for some reason it brought her to tears. I do remember that. With me, it just affected me like it was sending me a, a message or something because that song, the piano player and the violinist that play in my band both went, Merle, this is like a classical piece of music. The song Signals from Malibu has the signals in it too and William McEwen, the movie producer, said boy, this is classic for a sci-fi. So I've sent that now to a couple of my sync agents because you know I'm getting so many songs in movie. Just in uh, 2022 I had something like 18 songs in movies and TV shows. Four more just since January. Yeah, and one of them was in an award-winning movie, The Trial of the Chicago 7. And a lot of the songs that they like are my 60s and 70s songs, because they do a lot of these kind of period piece movies. I'm very thankful that that's happening, Joanna, because my band hasn't been playing much now. It first started because of COVID, and then, uh, bless his heart, my drummer of 38 years died last year after getting a COVID booster shot. I'm really sorry to hear that. Not unusual, but sadly. In the same month, another band member decided he was going to start riding a motorcycle because the gas <laughs> went up so high here in California. And a lady pulled out in front of him, and he lived. He had to lay the bike down though but it broke his shoulder and his knee and he's still going to therapy and then our bass player got COVID was sick in the hospital for a while and then he got a lower back operation so we haven't played anywhere since all of this has happened and you know now all of California is flooded a mile down the road from me towards the ocean the little town of Oceano it's been on national news the whole thing is flooded because all of the dams are full of water and they're going over the spillway and uh, all the way up the coast up to Monterey, San Francisco was flooded, LA was flooded and we've been having one storm after another and this is the first day now just about since January that we actually haven't had a deluge of rain. We've got four days. They said it's going to be clear and we're going to have sun, but another storm is coming next Tuesday. It's kind of weird, and I tell people, I think this all has something to do with the poles have changed for the planet a little bit, because scientists and a weather person I know in, in the college here said it's affecting the weather belts. There's a lot going on, and I'm not sure uh, some of it isn't um, orchestrated as well, which adds another factor of confusion into it, yeah. because, um, you know, they've weaponized the weather for, for very many years, sadly. It, it's really phenomenal, the output you've had, but the one of the songs that you're most known for, which uh, I have to admit I hadn't heard of when we were doing the interview, but I knew the song immediately when I heard it, and that is, of course, the famous Wipeout. How did that come about? Well, I was uh, 17 years old, and the first time I had played music anywhere was a little theater here in Arroyo Grande, where I live. And I was working as a cleanup person, and I would set the marquee, and I worked on the 
weekends when they had the, the kids matinees, you know, they were kids-oriented uh, movies, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. The manager hired me to get up in between the theaters one day when he heard me practicing when the theater was empty, and uh, he paid me a little extra, which was great, and um, he would have me get up and do four songs in between the matinee movies each day. I was still in high school then, and some other high school students that were playing, and a, a, a guy that I was teaching to play bass, and we formed the band, The Impacts. And so we started playing first at high school dances and things, and then we got a, a gig playing at a restaurant in Pismo Beach, which is, you know, a famous beach here. And there was a big dance hall down the street that held about 1,200 people. And the owner of the dance hall heard us playing and thought we were really good. And he offered us the weekend spot as the house band. We played Friday night, Saturday, and Sunday matinees at this big ballroom called the Rose Garden Ballroom. And so I was a surfer, and I was writing instrumentals, because that was popular in the day, but the term surf music hadn't been coined yet. And I started, uh, Pier is right near this uh, dance hall, and it was a big dance hall in the 40s, even. And it was a big, really neat building with a lot of character. And so I was out there surfing one day, and I'd written this song called Kick Out, which was a surf term, and we were playing these songs on stage, and uh, I was putting surf titles to them. And so I had this song called Kick Out already written, and I was daydreaming, sitting on my board, and a big wave came along and took me over the falls and drug me along the sand, and I had sand in my face and my ears, and our sax player was sitting up against the break wall, and there were a lot of pretty girls sitting along there, and he was going, ah, ha, 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 look at Merle, he really got wiped out on that one, you know, and he was embarrassing me in front of these pretty girls. So I go up, and there were outdoor showers there, and get all the sand and water out of my hair and my ears, and put my board in the car, and I'm driving home, and I'm thinking, Wipeout. That might be a better title for that song instead of Kick Out. So we started calling it Wipeout, and then these two producers, and a producer from Hollywood was up here vacationing and heard us playing and said, how would you boys like to cut a record? Do you have enough songs for an album? And I said, oh, we got enough for two albums. So they took us down to L.A. And one afternoon, we recorded an entire album and Wipeout was in that set. Well, that's pretty phenomenal. And, and were you still around 17 at the time? I was still 17 and... Uh, you know, it, it was really something that they sold the record to Delphi Records, which was a big label then that put out Richie Valens, a bunch of other artists. And we had no idea, Joanna, what contracts were or how to copyright songs or anything, you know, or anything about ASCAP or BMI. And these guys got an undisclosed amount of money in front from the record company, and they didn't put any song writers on the back of all of the songs that I wrote most of, and they had all of the money, including the radio airplay, going to them. So they wanted us to record again, and the first version of Wipeout only had one drum solo in it. They had us come back down to L.A., and they wanted us to redo Wipeout and a few other songs that I had written that ended up on compilations with then other surf bands. So they said, but you need to put that drum solo in every verse. 
and we thought that was a dumb idea. And then we said, well, we're not going to record until you give us a contract. My dad asked if, did you boys sign anything? How are you going to get anything from this? So they brought out some contracts, and we kind of read them and didn't really understand what we were signing. And we signed it, and we recorded the song, took the song home to our parents, I mean the contract, and oh, and they paid us a dollar. They said some money had to be exchanged for it to be legal. Yeah, just any money to make it legal. My dad looked at it and said, you boys just signed all of your rights away for a dollar. And he was right. We took it to an attorney, and there really wasn't anything we could do. We were all 18 by then, and uh, it took me till 1994 to get the rights back, that album, and that song. And we finally started getting royalties from the whole album. Got the money, and... Uh, we had an attorney, and luckily the president of the record company decided, well, he could give it to us, so we started making money from it from then on. But these guys, they were song sharks, we call them, because they did this to so many bands, and they played our second version of Wipeout for a whole bunch of different bands, and the Ventures even heard it and did a recording of it. And I didn't get any anything out of any of those. I find, The first check I got, we were all so happy, and this was in 1994, the record company gave us a check for $4,800. Oh, gosh. And I but millions had been made. We split it, yeah. split it up with the band members that were still alive. And the, the bass player that I had taught, he had passed away. The drummer had passed away. The other guitar player, I think he had passed away then. And a lot of those guys, that, that they didn't take drugs. They were all cigarette smokers. Story of Wipeout. <laughs> And now, one of the legendary creators of instrumental surf music, Merle Fankhauser. Thanks to Willie Kay and Willie Nelson. We're going to do Wipeout for you right now.
Yeah, the, well, Warner Brothers bought the rights to it from uh, Delphi Records, and Bob Keane, who was the owner, he's long passed away, and before he passed away, he sold the rights to that album and a bunch of other ones he had. And now they're very honest, Joanna. I get the checks, you know, every six months uh, they pay the royalties. Oh, good. And that's great. Quite and right. They reissued our entire album with our names on it and the songwriting credits. And then they even took our second version of Wipeout, which never came out, and put it on a compilation with the Beach Boys, the Lively Ones, a whole bunch of bands, and they put that version out that has been on a shelf somewhere for 50, 60 years, and it, they put it out on a CD called Surf Hits. I made some money off of that, so good. that was good. Tell us about this a film that you're going to be in this year, that's 2023, a tribute to a friend of yours who is a pianist whiz kid by all accounts, Nikki. Yes, Nikki Hopkins, what a wonderful person. I cried when he passed away too. He had a stomach aneurysm and he was down in Florida recording hey nick it's great to have you here today all the way here from england to sunny california yeah. when did you actually start playing keyboards i started when i was three three yeah. years old well you know the story it was when i was a little kid and i was tall enough to reach up to play this well, well i didn't know what was up there it's just this table thing and all of a sudden these things <laughs> on the top which were the keys right uh -huh. started making a noise uh -huh. and i got into it mum lifted me up helped me for about three years and wow. you know, I picked it up. So by the time you were six, you were rocking out, huh? Mm, almost. <laughs> yeah. And then uh, what, what was your first uh, professional gigs that you actually did? The first pro gig I did was with this bizarre character called Screaming Lord Such. Oh yes, I remember <laughs> Screaming Lord Such. I know, he yes. toured here with a Union Jack covered Rolls Royce. Yes, I saw that in, in Hollywood. I mm -hmm. remember seeing that. Me too. And what year was that about? 68. That was 68? Yeah. Oh, that was, no, that was when he was I, over here. Yeah, I thought it was earlier. For me, it was 1960. Now, yeah. that was his first band. In fact, everybody who was in the band, including such, was their first band. Six. I see. Um, but the first time where I did any playing live was in 68 mm -hmm. with Jeff Beck. Okay. And I have to admit, being I guess now we're one. We're the ones who are considered the old farts, you know. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it, it's funny. But I swear that our music was better than most things that are going 63. on today. Oh. Sixty-two to sixty-three. Sixty-two. And curiously enough, it was during that period of doing the marquee every week that I met up with the Stones. You see. In fact, they were just starting, and we were just starting. We already mm -hmm. had our audience. Mm -hmm. uh, they didn't, so they were our support band. It's about yeah. 1967. Uh -huh. Now they had, as I say, they'd become incredibly successful. And apart from, I think, their first album, all their albums then were done in the States. That started a relationship that actually went on till about 1981. Devil, Angie, um, I forget how most yeah. <laughs> songs of it, it goes. Right. I'd love to see the Tin Man album come out, except yeah. I think I own the rights to it, so it may you not. You think you own the rights? Well, so <laughs> 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 I had this real sharp lawyer, right, uh -huh. back then, and got about 72, and he set it up so that the rights came back to me after seven years. Let's get into that. We're going to take a break <laughs> right now, and we'll be right back. He had played on many of the Beatles records, a lot of the Rolling Stones, Rod Stewart, you know, all of the 60s and 70s stuff. He played on John Lennon's Imagine album. He played on Imagine. I have a picture of him sitting at the piano with John. He was just a remarkable person. I met him when I had him on my TV show I was doing in 1991 called California Music. And it was on satellite and it went all over the United States and parts of South America. Uh, we hit it off right away and 
And uh, he said, let's do some recording. So I got him on Queen Moo, beautiful piano part that ended up on Return to Moo. And this was in 1991 and 92, and we did a concert together, and I did a great interview with him live on the TV show. And me, and he and his wife, Moira, would stay at my house here on the Central Coast whenever they were coming through. And we were scheduled to get together again when he passed away in Florida. I wrote a song that uh, called Nikki's Song. It came out on CD in 1995 and got a lot of radio play, and I got tons of mail from K and all over Europe. It's on YouTube, Nikki's Song by Merle Pankhausen. This one's for Nikki, my friend the piano man. This one's for Nikki. Again. I can see him in the stars Laying in that silver bed This one's for Nikki My friend the piano man He was always there To mend a band of hand Getting the music together As we come to uh, the conclusion of our chat, it's been a delight and thank you very much for spending the time. Give us your contact details, your website, uh, your book. And you can reach me at Merle at MerleFankhauser.com. And that's my website, MerleFankhauser.com. You know, and it's a picture of my 1968 band, HMS Bounty. I looked at that background, Joanna, and I said, this looks like it could have been done by Peter Mack. Yes, absolutely. It, it's yeah. just great. And everybody here in California just loves it. And people are emailing me from all over the world, even the Czech Republic. <laughs>
space above when I should have been where 